Meg Rossoff, you're at the Oxford Literary Festival. What makes this festival so special? Oh, I love the Oxford Festival because um, most festivals, my audiences are primarily teenagers. When it, for some bizarre reason, whenever I come to Oxford, my, I get more adults. And I kind of like talking to adults because they don't give you that whatever look. So, yeah, special, special. My, my favorite, really, even though you're not supposed to say that. You trained as a sculptor. Any transferable skills with writing? Absolutely no transferable skills from being a sculptor. That was a very long time ago, and I didn't even understand it when I was doing it. So I don't think the years have made it clearer to me. How I Live Now was your breakthrough novel. It's a, it's a YA novel, but enjoyed by adults as well. You said, I just write, and then someone else decides who to sell it to. True or false? It's because I write about adolescence. And if you write about adolescents, they tend to think you are writing for teenagers. And I do connect with a big group of teenagers, but I also connect with a big group of people who are thinking about that period of time in their lives. Um, I, I spent probably 30 years um, uh, going through my own adolescence. I sort of just came out of it a few years ago. And so it's something I've really thought over quite a lot. So it makes me an expert. Can you talk about the decision to write in your 40s? Was the urge always there? Yes, it was a combination of self-loathing and despair, I think, that drove me to it in the end. And also, <clears throat> my sister died of cancer, and I was really thinking very heavily about my own uh, mortality and thinking that I would have the world's most pathetic funeral because everyone would say Meg did nothing but complain about the jobs she had and she also got fired a lot. So I thought I may as well try writing, I've got absolutely nothing to lose. And I understand you got thrown out of a choir on a visit to England for bad behaviour. You said a lot of things in your life have ended that way. Natural born rebel? No one has ever asked me about being thrown out of the choir. Yeah, I've been thrown out of a lot of things, a lot of jobs, a lot of yeah, I guess so. I guess I, I don't, yeah, I'm bad. I'm basically, I don't like being told what to do unless it's the right person saying it in the right way. I don't know. It's why I work at home alone in the dark like a mushroom, you know. Meg, what is it with you and horses? It's big. It's very big. I, um, yeah, I'm a bit of a fanatic. I've sort of broken the habit recently because I was told by a neurologist that um, I should never ride again because I've had five concussions and all I really have is my brain. I don't think I can fall back on either my ballet skills or my uh, catwalk modeling. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think there must be a horse gene because I love riding and I love the discipline of it. And also when you get to be my sort of age, it's good to have a sport you can do sitting down. You write both male and female central characters, often in the first person. Any issues with either of those? Not for me, although I do make it clear that I could probably not write a real macho, football-loving uh, male character. I'm not... No one's come to me to do the biography of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Although, I was very cross that they didn't ask me to be the next James Bond writer because I have read every James Bond book a thousand times and could easily write the, the next one. But they haven't asked me. It's very upsetting. I don't want you to feel like you're on trial, but you've also been quoted as saying, life is absolutely horrific, leading to absolute horror. How does your sense of humour play with that? Did I say that? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, what a dark and horrid person <laughs> I am. Um, well, yeah, I kind of believe that. I mean, isn't it true? I don't know. Um, yes, I think most writers are a little on the depressive side. Well, because we spend all our times, you know, excavating the dark stuff. And even if you're writing humor or you're not dealing with it directly in your writing, you're dealing it with it. Uh, in, with your sensibility. And I think if you're not a bit dark as a writer, you're probably not a very good writer. There's a well-known quote from How I Live Now, I don't get nearly enough credit in life for the things I manage not to say. Now's your chance, Meg. 
right? Yes, it, you know, it's very funny that people keep pulling that quote out of How I Live Now because it's probably the closest uh, line in the book to how I really am. And uh, yeah, I was born with a big mouth. And when you come and live in England, uh, people say, oh, don't, don't mind her, she's just an American. But actually in America, it's just as bad. And they think I'm just as unpleasant and outrageous. Um, I, you don't really have to ask me to say the things that I don't say, because they're everywhere. Yeah. You've blogged about writing and said, it gets harder and harder instead of easier and easier. How do you deal with that? Um, yeah, it's a terrible, terrible fact. And there was that fabulous Philip Roth story recently where the, somebody accosted him in a deli and said, do you have any words of advice for me? You know, I'm having my first no novel published. And he said, run away. It's the worst career in the world. It's horrible. It's, now's your chance. Get out while you can. Um, and I'm with him on that. Um, yeah, I think it gets harder because you you have to excavate deeper and deeper, you know, as you go through the subjects you're interested in, in order to find the material. And it probably gets scarier and scarier, depending on your brain, obviously. But mine is, mine's pretty dark down there. Can we talk now about Picture Me Gone, your new novel? It had a great genesis, actually, because I didn't think it would ever happen. Um, I had been writing nothing for a few months. And then I wrote a blog about naming characters because my editor was on my back saying, how's the book going? And I kept going, fine. And so I wrote a blog saying, here's how you name characters. And the name of the main character in my new book is Mila. But there was no new book and there was no Mila. And then <clears throat> I was on Hampstead Heath with my dogs. And a little dog came running up to me. And on the tag was the name Mila. And I thought, <laughs> if only I believed in God, I would think God is telling me to get to work. And the weird thing was, I then sat down to work and the book was there. So, you know, it's the good and the bad. It's the m weeks and months sometimes of waiting, which not everyone does, but, um, and thinking you've written your last book and you'll never have an idea again and it's finished and your family's gonna starve in the gutter. I could go on on this theme. Um, and sometimes you just have to have faith that if you hang on long enough, something will come back. Um, but anyway, so the book is, is kind of a detective story in a very kind of Meg-ish way. I mean, it's not a real detective story, but it's about a uh, sort of father in his late 50s and his daughter, who's 12, and they go over to America because his best friend has disappeared. And the girl is a little bit of a seer and um, uh, they're trying to figure out why he's left and they sort of go off looking for him in the place they think he might be and of course they find stuff that they didn't think they would find. And I didn't really know why he'd left for draft after draft after draft and that's another example of hanging on, you know, and just hoping it'll reveal itself and it did eventually and I'm actually very, very pleased with it. It's a, I'm not just saying that because you're supposed to say it and your PR tells you to. I, it's a very gentle book, but it's very, very heartfelt, very lovely emotional book. And the future, is there a, is there a book you haven't written that you have on the back burner or that someone else's work maybe you admire or some kind of a trilogy or a new form that you want to attack? Yeah, I have always wanted to write a sort of version of the Magic Unicorn books because when my daughter was little she used to go outside and stare up at the sky and say I can't remember what the incantation is but it ended with make my little colt forlorn turn into a unicorn I mean that's great that's great and I, I know it's been done but people will forget about it and then I can do my own sort of magic and, and you know I love horses and that's in my future definitely as I get more and more senile it'll be ponies mm -hmm.